about how sort of my uh, contribution reflects reality, um, how this material I've been working with can be sort of couched in, 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 in terms of this, this word we've been using. Uh, and I will start by saying that this is kind of a different scale than we've been working with uh, the last couple of days. Um, I've been, for the last two or three years, collecting or kind of constructing a, uh, a database of historical material, which is a, a company to the sort of de facto Icelandic National Sites Register. And so while uh, the work is quite heavily archaeological, today I'm speaking almost kind of exclusively from the historical record. And uh, so the, the distribution of, of, of sites uh, that they're working with is, is sort of almost across the entire country. Uh, the east is not there, and I'll get to that in a bit. And we're looking at uh, 3,560 farms. And I'll get to what, what that means in a second. So, immediately what strikes me is that everyone who's spoken of the rural uh, has kind of used them in a, in a contrasting sense. You know, it's, it's not the urban, um, it's, it's sort of, of course, all these sort of shades of, of, of grain between those. But um, this society could be, could be described as just kind of purely rural, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, Icelandic society is characterized from the, at least from the 12th century up until the 19th century by uh, kind of imposed stability, which uh, centers around the farm as a legal, productive, and really sort of social unit in the country. So we have just around 4,000 farms, and your vote, your uh, rights to marriage, your uh, social status, is all sort of funneled through that one uh, social unit. And even though in, in actuality that's sort of undermined, of course, by, by everyday living, uh, it still provides a kind of useful unit of analysis because uh, in so many ways, uh, kind of Icelandic rural life in the medieval period was funneled through this, this idea of the, of the farm. Uh, in Icelandic, it's called Lokiya. Uh, but of course, uh, a community is not made from a single unit, and what is quite clear, and I'll hope, hopefully I'll show these on the maps later, is that these farms kind of cluster immediately into uh, to core communities, with uh, using Ingalls' word, word cascade, which say sort of shared everyday uh, landscapes and better with memory and dwelling and so on. Um, but these don't form any sort of rigid hierarchy. There is no uh, sort of central urban administrative area uh, that's directing the, the countryside. It's, it's, more, it's much more sort of flat. And maybe that's something that's particularly rural. Um, for that reason, uh, while there are clear instances of sort of core and periphery in this rural landscape, which are articulated through issues of, sort of land productivity, ease of movement, remoteness and access, as well as seasonality, uh, I, I feel like centrality <coughs> in this rural landscape is a much more sort of negotiated concept um, based on various things that I'll cover in my, my case studies. Uh, that's the, I feel, like, I feel like I have to talk about the underlying data to be able to reflect on how, um, how I've been interpreting the, the, the society. And this is my main uh, uh, work. It's a land register from the early 18th century done uh, in the sort of spirit of improvement. It was done as a, as a foundation for uh, improving uh, society in Iceland for all aspects, you know, ideological, etc. Um, and there's a gap because the easternmost part of the register was, is, was uh, lost in the Great Fire of 1728 in Copenhagen. But we're still left with a good 90% of the record. 80, 80 to 90%, which is to say the 3,556 farms out of the 4,000. Um, I'm a bit of a data nerd, so I feel like I need to show this. Um, I, think, I think transparency to the, the primary record is quite important. Uh, it allows for flexibility. And what I decided immediately was that I, even though I want to spend a lot of time sort of encoding and interpreting the data, uh, the, 
the text should be there. So I've kind of funneled the, the primary text, all scanned and recognized, through uh, XML and then uh, Postgres into a relational database structure that still has this kind of sea of text that uh, complements the, the relational data structure. And for that reason, uh, my model has, you call it a kind of rigid substructure of normalized strong relationships, uh, which has a sort of overlying superstructure allowing for um, kind of flexible speculative query. And uh, I, I feel like in a way that's, that's, a, that's a way to think about the rural society in a way, and I'll get to that later. Um, of course, the, the next question is, what is a farm? Uh, it's, it's kind of, it's legally defined. It has a lot of significance and, under, and, uh, and importance for the people living there. Um, translating that into data, translating that into interpreting the past uh, is quite tricky. But I, I just sort of broke down the, the sort of things that are always mentioned for every single farm. And what, what emerges is a lot of information not just about the affordances of the landscape, but about sort of interpersonal relationships, who owns it, where do they live. Um, one thing that's quite clear is that uh, few farms seem to exist in sort of enclosed uh, hermeneutic or sort of hermetic uh, subsistence. It's more to do with, with they, they sort of survive by having resource links to other farms. So if we kind of extend that into a diagram, <coughs> I can think of kind of a single farm as, as this. There's a, there's a central farm. They very often, if the farm is large enough, have tenant farms. Uh, it's, it's a way to kind of utilize remote parts of the landscape if they manage to sort of establish a settlement, like a satellite settlement within their land. And then they have access to lots of resources, sort of productive resources like pasture, uh, driftwood, peat, etc. And then uh, the way the, the book describes the relationships between farms, we, we build a kind of diagram uh, linking lots and lots of farms. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show how this works in practice. This is uh, one farm in the, the west of the country called Stahop. And uh, when you read through the, the register, this is what you get. You get uh, lots and lots of places that are somehow linked to it. Um, these tend to be uh, uh, pasture, sequel pasture, uh, access to woodland. Uh, the, the, the one at the very, very north is a driftwood outpost. They own that farm and they somehow get the driftwood down uh, into, uh, you know, down, down south um, with sort of every few years. So this is what that sort of diagram looks like uh, when, when mapping the landscape. So if I, if I try to kind of come, come up with a working definition about what, what, what the farm is, we'd say that the spatial syntax of the farm comprises an assemblage of relational networks, some relations internal to the, the farm boundaries, others connecting to external nodes such as other farms in common land, and in this context, rurality might be seen as the way in which these relations and interactions pattern land use and lived experience across, networks, across these networks of farms. And I'm just going to show you a few of these networks to, to give you an, uh, an idea of how interconnected and spatially extensive they are. Um, before that, I want to just talk about why I think networks are quite a useful way to think about the past. This is taken from a couple of recent publications by Carl Nathan and, and Tom Bruggins. Uh, networks force us to consider the relationships between entities. Nothing is truly sort of... Uh, in, in void space, and it's, it's really about how things relate to each other. They're inherently spatial, with the flexibility of being both social and physical. Uh, there are strong methods for articulating <coughs> scales, moving from a single farm to a community to the entire country is quite, uh, is facilitated by thinking of networks. You can incorporate human and non-human agency, and temporal dimensions. So just a, a quick view of, of the sort of networks I've been mapping. That's uh, uh, an instance of What's what probably the most clear sort of community forming uh, types of networks? They are the the parishes of the country, not just important for services, but they they sort of form a quite close relationship to how um, welfare works in the society. The 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 tithe that's being funneled into the the, the church is being used to uh, to uh, support the 
the old, the, the, uh, those who cannot work for themselves. Uh, that's what I've started to map is the, the access to resources. That's driftwood, uh, driftwood and whale, uh, beach whale, um, starting in the west, with the, the west fjords. Again, very spatially extensive, uh, very important to the uh, subsistence of communities far, far away from where the, the resource starts, and, and a way to kind of link communities across the country. Um, I spoke about tenant farms earlier, and I, I said that tenant farms ex, ex, uh, sort of you, you are usually found within the, the farm boundaries. It's not quite true because boundaries aren't necessarily that clear. Um, and when you map the relationship between main farms and tenant farms, it's it's never so sort of, it's never a nice enclosed system. Sometimes it extends across the, the country. Sometimes they, they find them. They, so these tenant farms form um, remote communities in the, on the outskirts of of, um, of Iceland's agricultural society and so on. Um, ownership networks have become quite complicated. That's the private network. That's uh, the, the state network. And then that's that's what happens if you try and put all of them together. And then you can kind of release, uh, you can kind of remove Iceland and look at what happens if you just sort of, uh, you know, get rid of the spatial anchoring uh, and see, in this case, the property network together. Uh, the reason I've gone very quickly through these is that I think this is a very sort of shallow way of, of, of thinking about what networks can do for our understanding of the past. Because what we're looking at is a sort of quite I would say that like the, the sort of the networks I've showed you takes us to the edge of what this thinking can do in uh, sort of in isolation, and they immediately call to mind all the justified critique we have of network analysis that it's sort of rigid, deterministic, inflexible. Um, but what I want to stress is that every line I've showed you so far is uh, well. First of all, it's a vector of sort of material flows. I have to keep that in mind. Uh, sometimes. Uh, it's sort of ideational vectors, but um, when you when you just kind of look at these lines, they, they tend to have some sort of material implication. Um, the other thing is that they are rarely straight. These are spindly lines, they're crooked, and they're story. Um, the, uh, the the sort of these sort of storied lines uh, really are at odds with how we kind of understand. Uh, the lived experience. This is something that Colin Affleck talks about quite a lot in his, in his book, and I want to continue with that. Um, I'm not saying that we should drop the network approach because, like I said earlier, it's a really useful way to keep to to transcend scales, to uh, to keep this sort of complexity somehow uh, uh, sort of held within within one uh, framework. But what's important is that we kind of have to read every line to understand exactly what the implications are. Um, and speculatively speaking, maybe reading these lines uh, helps us read Icelandic rurality. So, if I if I take you on sort of three case studies to to examine these lines in, in more detail, I want to start with how uh, rent is paid in the country. Uh, this is showing the the royal property network, and what's clear is that even though these are all notionally owned by the king, there's quite a big big difference between say. Those two, because um, there is no central administration for these. They're essentially just auctioned off as uh, as kind of estates for someone to manage. So uh, what's clear from reading the record is uh, it has there's a there's a sort of the the distance of where your temporary landlord lives has quite a big impact on how you uh, on how you live as a tenant. So if we take a single person, this guy is called Sir Pearson. He's interesting because. He has just acquired this sort of uh, assemblage of, of farms to manage in the north. He lives in the south. And when we read a little bit into how uh, his tenants pay tithe to him or rent to him, um, it's by no means a straight line. And it's not even a line between A and B. Instead, what we have is this sort of very interesting negotiation between um, multiple farms. Uh, the description essentially reads: uh, In the in the early spring, the tenants bring a flock of sheep down south over the heath 
and then they have a choice of leaving them at three different locations in, in a sort of intermediary, intermediary community between where the tenant lives and the, the temporary landlord, Sir uh, Uh The other alternative is taking them all the way down to Alpingi. And then presumably there's another sort of corresponding line going from the south into this enclosed space of interaction, uh, picking up the sheep. So if we can kind of think about how this rel relates to the other networks, instead of thinking of them, thinking of them as straight lines, as, instead of thinking of them as sort of abstract interactions, uh, they are very sort of they're very storied, they're bent, they're crooked, and uh, they enrich in a lot of ways uh, how we understand how rurality kind of functioned in early 18th century Iceland. So that's just taking the lines sort of out of context. Scaling up a bit shows the way driftwood is managed in the country. And what I think is interesting uh, with this picture that I'll explain a little bit is that this is kind of industry in the absence of industry. Driftwood is essential for uh, building, essential for the running of farms, maintenance of, of buildings and so on. Uh, but of course, it's a coastal resource. It's a coastal resource that just happens to be inversely proportional to uh, productive farmland in a lot of cases, which is to say that driftwood ends up in places where you would not want to live, particularly. Um, and so here we see the size of dots are essentially the productivity of the land. It's the uh, value of the land, uh, which uh, corresponds quite, quite well with, with the sort of productive capacities of the, of the land. And the, the lines are going <coughs> towards the northern side of the West Fjords, uh, showing uh, resource claims from productive areas to non-productive areas. So the farms where the lines originate, they own or have like massive rights over the driftwood collecting um, on the farms at the terminal ends of the lines. Um, why is this a particularly rural power pattern? I, I believe that the if we had some sort of industrial uh, formation, this wouldn't really happen. But because, like I said, the way Iceland society is legally structured, there are no industrial formations uh, beyond the, the farm themselves. So what happens is people are sent to manage these farms, living on essentially the worst land in the country, um, just to make sure that the, the driftwood uh, comes to shore. I don't know if you guys know much about how driftwood comes, but it sort of it sort of gets into the intertidal zone, and if someone doesn't pull it out of the intertidal zone, it tends to go away. So someone has to live there to manage the, the driftwood coming ashore. Um, I I like uh, the discussion yesterday about environmental injustice because what what I see here is a sort of enrichment of the of the areas down south uh, at the expense of the empowerment and impoverishment of those who have to live up in the north. And just because we're running out of time, I'll, I'll give you one more example, uh, which has to do with this, this idea that I've been thinking about uh, in terms of the rural. Um, and I tried to imagine what a rural center is like, because an urban center, I think, is quite clear. When I try and understand how kind of central uh, nodes in this rural network form. What's clear is that they are uh, they're temporary. Uh, they have to do with uh, seasonal use of the land, transhumans. Uh, the, the example I have here is a fishing station. Uh, fishing took place at certain uh, times of the year, uh, off like kind of early spring, you could say, when uh, farmers were able to send their servants away from the farm to, to sort of generate some other means of, uh, some other type of produce. But uh, a typical fishing station in this culture does not sort of uh, form a, a village where uh, there's a sort of central person who is in charge of the village who kind of owns or, or operates everything that, that's happened. Instead, um, all these farms around that one place up there here, that they negotiate access to their harbor. And this access is temporary. When you read the description, 
Some have just acquired it, other people have died and they've stopped using theirs. Um, meaning that this network is quite temporary. The, 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 the people who end up going there every spring um, change from season to season. This place is central in a way, but for very sort of short periods uh, and central in very different senses as, as time goes by. So instead of thinking of that as a rural center, uh, I instead kind of like to think of it as a, as a rural century. And maybe that's something that is specific or maybe more characteristic in rurality than in urbanity. Um, and just to, to finish, um, I like to revisit my, uh, my argument that, that kind of going through networks is a, is a good way of understanding the rural. Um, but that we have to sort of keep in mind that, uh, that every line is a storyline, every line is a story line. Um, it calls for a different reading of these lines, a mixture of close reading, like I did with the first line, and distant reading, like I did with the assemblage of the second lines. And that when you think of it this way, uh, we get to a network analysis that's more concerned with kind of knots and tangles rather than straight lines. And, and perhaps uh, this is particularly important for understanding rural society because of the importance of these sort of deep, weak, occasional ties that are uh, connecting people across the landscape. And so, just to finish, I like network analysis, but I think it should look less like this and more like that, <laughs> with the important proviso that we should be able to trace any one line through the tangle. Thanks. Mm -hmm.